This is Craig Pence, and in this video we'll examine accounting for uncollectible accounts expense. When companies begin to make sales on credit, they open the door to a huge number of record-keeping complications and costs. Clerks have to be hired, and a credit manager has to be hired to oversee the credit department. This is very costly, so we might wonder why companies ever decide to make credit sales at all. Let's look at an example. We see here that if sales increase by 50% when credit terms are offered, this results in a 50% increase in gross profit, and even if operating expenses double as they do here, net income still increases. Therefore, this company will find it attractive to offer credit terms even though it's going to substantially increase its operating expenses. There is another cost, though, that's incurred when credit sales are made. This cost is referred to as a bad debt loss, or an uncollectible account expense, and it occurs when a sale is made to a customer who simply never pays. When accounts go bad, the company must write off the customer's account receivable balance. Companies generally have two methods they can use. One is called the direct write-off method, and the other is called the allowance method. Direct write-off is the simplest. When the company realizes that one of its accounts will never be collected, it writes off the account by crediting accounts receivable. It then debits an expense account called uncollectible accounts expense, or sometimes bad debts expense. The direct write-off method is very straightforward, but there's a problem with it. Namely, it violates the matching principle. If you recall from the earlier videos, the matching principle tells us that in order to accurately determine the net income for a period, the expenses that were incurred in that period should be reported on the same period's income statement. That way the expenses will be matched up with the revenues they help produce. When expenses and revenues are mismatched between accounting periods, the result will be a distorted net income figure. Let's look at an example. If $120,000 in credit sales are made in year 20X1, then $120,000 of revenue will be reported on the 20X1 income statement. Let's say that none of the accounts become uncollectible until 20X2, and at that time a $900 account is written off as uncollectible. And herein lies the problem. Under the direct write-off method, the uncollectible account expense will be recorded in 20X2, but the sales revenue was recorded in 20X1. This uncollectible account expense is one of the expenses that were incurred in order to generate the 20X1 sales revenue, and it was incurred during 20X1 when the sale was made to the wrong person. So, in keeping with the matching principle, the uncollectible account expense should be reported on the 20X1 income statement along with the sales revenue. Use of the direct write-off method does not allow us to do this, but another method, the allowance method, does. And this is why direct write-off is not allowed under generally accepted accounting principles, but the allowance method is. Here's how the allowance method works. At the end of 20X1, before any of the accounts go bad, we estimate the amount of uncollectible accounts and we make an end of period entry to record the expense. This will allow us to follow the matching principle and record the expense in 20X1 so it can be placed on the 20X1 income statement. It's only an estimate though, and there will always be error in our estimate. In accounting, when we're reasonably certain that an expense has been incurred, and we can make a reasonable estimate of the amount, then we record the expense. If anyone criticizes us for putting an estimated expense on the income statement, we can simply ask what they'd prefer. Should we record an estimated expense that might be wrong by $100 or so, or simply not record any expense at all and be wrong by thousands? Well, let's return to our example, and we'll use the allowance method to record the transactions. We know that the company had $120,000 of credit sales, so we would debit accounts receivable and credit sales for $120,000 during 20X1. Then $110,000 of the accounts were collected, so we would debit cash and credit accounts receivable. 
This leaves a balance of $10,000 in accounts receivable at the end of 20x1. It's now time, under the allowance method, to estimate the uncollectible accounts. Suppose we guess that it will be $1,000. We know that the actual write-off will be for $900, so we'll find out in 20x2 that our estimate is off by $100. But on December 31st we won't know this, and we'll debit uncollectible accounts expense for $1,000. This expense now appears on the 20x1 income statement just as the matching principle requires. It's now time to record the credit in the entry and we run into a little bit of a problem since we're not able to credit accounts receivable. Here's why. Companies keep a subsidiary ledger of customer accounts so that they can maintain control over their customers balances. That means that they keep records regarding the amounts owed, the collection due dates, and so on for each customer. Think of this subsidiary ledger as a filing cabinet full of customer files. Whenever a customer buys something on account or pays an account balance, we debit or credit accounts receivable in the general ledger. We then record the sale or the collection in the customer's file. Accounts receivable in the general ledger is the controlling account over the files in the filing cabinet. That means that whenever we record anything in accounts receivable in the general ledger, we also record it in the customer's files. Because of this subsidiary ledger, we will not be able to credit accounts receivable in our December 31st entry. If we do, we'll have to also record this in a customer's file, and since none of the accounts are even overdue right now, we wouldn't know whose account to credit. Therefore, we'll record the credit in another account that is linked to accounts receivable. The name of this account is Allowance for Uncollectible Accounts, or something similar, and this is where the allowance method gets its name. The allowance account is a contra account, two accounts receivable. That means that the credit balance in the account is subtracted from accounts receivable on the balance sheet to determine the carrying value of the accounts. This carrying value is the estimated collectible value of the accounts, or in other words, their net realizable value. It's the amount that generally accepted accounting principles requires us to carry the receivables at on the balance sheet. Let's look at the entries made to record the transactions during 20x2 under the allowance method. During 20x2, we again record credit sales of $120,000 and the collection of $110,000 of these sales along with $9,100 of the beginning balance in accounts receivable. The other $900 of the beginning balance turned out to be uncollectible. When we record this write-off in 20x2, we credit accounts receivable in the general ledger and in the customer's file in the subsidiary ledger. And then, instead of debiting uncollectible accounts expense, we debit the allowance account. What's happening is this. The uncollectible amount is being moved out of temporary storage in the allowance account and into accounts receivable. No expense is recorded here because it already has been back on December 31st, 20x1, in the end of period entry. This is the process we'll follow under the allowance method. This is a pretty simple process, but there is still another complication we have to deal with. Let's examine it now. Posting the sales and collections transactions to the ledger, along with the $900 write-off, gives us an ending balance of $10,000 again in accounts receivable. It's now December 31st, 20x2, and time to estimate our uncollectible accounts. Let's say that we again come up with a $1,000 estimate and we make the standard end of period entry. We debit uncollectible accounts expense and credit the allowance account for $1,000. Note that this time our ending balance in the allowance account becomes $1,100. This is the complication. This is happening because we had $100 left in the account prior to making this $1,000 entry. Where did it come from? Well, back on December 31st, 20x1, we estimated that $1,000 of accounts would be written off, but only $900 were. The remaining $100 in the account is the amount of the error in our previous estimate. 
Since we overestimated the write-offs by $100, we have a credit balance remaining in the account. Had we underestimated them, and the write-offs were, say, $1,100, a $100 debit balance would be left in the account. Since our estimate will never be perfect, this will be the norm. We should expect that there will be a debit or a credit balance, hopefully a small one, left in the allowance account at the end of every accounting period. What do we do about this? Well, there are two approaches that are used. In the first, we do nothing at all. We simply make the entry, just as we did, for the $1,000 estimate. Note that under this approach, the balance in uncollectible accounts expense will be $1,000, equal to our estimate. So the income statement will report our estimated expense just fine. However, the balance in the allowance account will be $1,100. This is not our estimate for uncollectible accounts. So the amount reported for the net realizable value of the accounts on the balance sheet will not be equal to the estimated collectible value of the accounts. This is the approach that's taken when the estimate is based on sales data. That is, if we determine the estimate by multiplying our sales balance by some percentage or obtain the estimate in any other way from the sales of the period, then we assume that it's the expense that is being estimated. And in that case, we want the expense amount on the income statement to be equal to our estimate. And we don't care about the misstatement of the net realizable value of the accounts on the balance sheet. This is called an income statement approach. However, if we base our estimate on the accounts themselves, either by taking a percentage of the balance in accounts receivable or by aging the accounts in some way, then we're using a balance sheet approach and the process changes. Now we assume that we're estimating the amount of the uncollectible accounts to report on the balance sheet and not the amount of the expense to report on the income statement. Therefore, we now want the balance that's left in the allowance account to be equal to our estimate. In our case, since there's a $100 balance in the account prior to making the end of period entry, and we want the balance to be $1,000, we'll need to credit the allowance account for $900. This means that uncollectible accounts expense will be debited for $900, and that $900 will be reported on the income statement instead of $1,000. But that's okay with us. We're able to report a $9,000 net realizable value for the accounts on the balance sheet, and that is our goal under this balance sheet approach. To summarize, under the allowance method, two approaches are acceptable. The income statement approach requires us to estimate the uncollectible account expense and make the end of period entry for the amount of the estimate. Any existing balance in the allowance account is ignored. Under the balance sheet approach, existing balances are not ignored. The company will estimate the amount of uncollectible accounts and then look to see what the balance is in the allowance account. When there's a credit balance remaining, such as our $100 credit balance in our example, then the company will make the end of period entry for an amount that's equal to the estimate minus the existing credit balance. For us, that was $1,000 minus $100, which gave us the $900 amount to use in our entry. Note that if there was a debit balance in the allowance account, the entry would be made for the estimate plus the existing debit balance. For example, if we had a $100 debit balance in our account, we would need to credit the allowance account for $1,100 in order to leave a $1,000 balance. In that case, the income statement would report an $1,100 expense amount. Which of all these methods and approaches should the company use? Well, first, because direct write-off violates the matching principle, a company could only use it when it has a very small amount of receivables and account write-offs. In that case, the difference between doing it the right way, using the allowance method, and the wrong way, using direct write-off, will be too small to matter. The principle of materiality will apply, and the company can justify use of the direct write-off method based on materiality. If the amount of the receivables and write-offs is not immaterially small, then the company will have to use the allowance method. Should the company use an income statement approach or a balance sheet approach? Either is acceptable, and the company will have to decide which approach best serves the needs of the financial statement users. Once a choice has been made, the company should apply it consistently. This is in keeping with the accounting principle of consistency. Well, this ends our video, and I hope it's been helpful to you.